morning, church, and welcome to our neighbors. I'm glad to be together with you. If we haven't met yet, my name is Michael, one of the pastors here at Neighborhood Church. And this morning, it is, uh, is my privilege to begin a, a new sermon series. So typically, our, our, we, we meet every week, and oftentimes there are bigger ideas than I can unpack. And, you know, I shoot for 20 minutes. I usually end up 30 to 40 uh, on rare occasions get to 50 minutes. Um, but there's usually ideas even that I just, because of skill or time, just cannot unpack. And so we try to group those things together uh, in ways that we can follow through. So we're beginning a new series today. We're going to work for the next three weeks. And we talked about last week how um, Jesus, not only did he die, he was executed, and he came back to life, which is in and of itself something to pay attention to, he also said ahead of time, so before any of that happened, he said ahead of time, hey, we're going to go to Jerusalem, the scribes and the Pharisees are going to kill me, and then I'm going to come, come back to life again after three days. So it's one thing to do a thing, it's another thing to know you're going to do the thing before you get to the thing, before anybody else does. And so if all of that is true about Jesus, then maybe we should take a closer look at some of the other things that Jesus said. So that's our purpose in, in, in doing this study together. We want to take a closer look at some of the things that Jesus taught um, and to see how they kind of carry out throughout the, the generations, even to our lives this morning. So I'd invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Uh, if you want to use the blue Bibles that are kind of tucked in the chairs in front of you, Matthew chapter 7 starts on page 1013. And if you're a guest with us, you don't have a Bible, and you like that blue one, then just write your name on it and uh, take it home. Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to begin reading in verse 7. And I'll just say that uh, to, as a means of introduction, that in Matthew chapter 7, we're actually at the end of Jesus' longest recorded sermon. So Matthew, as he writes about the biography of Jesus, as he tells Jesus' story, he actually organizes his book around five different teachings of Jesus. And the first one is the longest. And we actually, uh, if you've been gathering along or walking along with us, have been studying in and out of this sermon for more than a year now. Um, so we've been working at this, sometimes called the Sermon on the Mount. We've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount off and on for, for almost a year. So if you're, if you're new with us, it's going to be great. Like, you'll, you'll track along. This will make sense by itself. But if you've been with us for a year or so, like, we've been in Matthew 5 through 7 for a long, long time. Um, because Jesus can teach it once, and it stands forever. It takes me a long time to work through Jesus' teaching. So um, as we begin and as we, as we come to the text, I just invite us to pause together and acknowledge that um, this isn't just a book, it's God's Word. And so as we approach God's Word, we need God to meet us in it. So let's pray together. It's our habit together to pray uh, the disciples' prayer. And so if you're not familiar with it, you'd like to pray out loud, the words are on the screen for you. Um, but at the very least, let's bow our hearts together and let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So let's read together Matthew chapter 7. And I'm going to read all of the verses that we'll cover together this morning. And then we'll go back and, and, and take them apart a little bit. So Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. 
enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. God blesses the reading of the word. When I, um, when I started to work on this series, it was my intent to begin in verse 12. And so taking a look at verse 12 and chewing on that a little bit, I'm going to knock something over. That's okay. Uh, looking at verse 12 and, and trying to figure out how we're going to chew on this, like that begins with a so. If you're looking at a different translation, sometimes it'll start with a therefore. And it just occurred to me that I, I'm not really going to be able to unpack for you uh, verse 12 unless I also give you verse 7. And so we're going to roll back up into verse 7. And we've covered this um, briefly before, but I think it reveals something about a tension that we carry within us. Um, God often will use something that we know to teach us something that we don't know. Okay? He uses things that we know to teach us things that we don't know. For instance, if I came up to you and began to try to unpack things for you in Mandarin Chinese, who would be able to follow? Like, I, can't, I cannot teach you something new unless I start with something that you already know. I have to speak in a language you can understand. And God oftentimes will use images that we're familiar with, and he will use those things to point us to a deeper truth, okay? Now, I'm aware that uh, we have sometimes tense relationships with our father, but I also won't apologize for God calling himself a father. So... If, if there's something in the word that, that is, is rubbing against me the wrong way or it's something in there that I, that I don't know that I quite buy into, um, I'm going to default in that God knew what he was talking about and I'm the one who's misunderstood him. So what, what is it that he's trying to communicate when he calls himself our father? And one of the things that I think was interesting is there's all kinds of pictures that God could use for himself, but he chose one that's universal. Everybody present, everyone living has a father, right? Like, he could have said, uh, God is our king, and he's a benevolent king. But I, I don't have a king, right? Like, I don't, I, I live in a democracy, we elect a president. So an elected president is a very different thing than a king who reigns by royal uh, decree, right? It's just a different thing, and so I'd have to communicate. But God says, let me, let me use an image that everybody already knows, so that we can relate, because there's nobody who got here by themselves. Even if you consider yourself to be a self-made person, there's nobody who got to the planet alone. Who here chose their birthday? It happened without your consent. And now, sometimes in my most cynical mornings, in my most cynical, it's like, God, you gave me this gift, and now I've got to figure out what to do with it. Like, I didn't ask to be born, but I'm going through all this, and now look, here we are. And so God uses a picture that we are familiar with to teach us something that we don't know. And what does he teach us? Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you... If his son asks him for bread, we'll give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. If you then who are evil know how to give good, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good gifts, give good things to those who ask him? I don't know your dad. And I don't know if, if as you're reading that description, you think, yeah, my dad probably would have just given me the snake. Like he was just that kind of guy. And I'm sorry if that has been your experience. But there's something implicit in here where God knows that that is not the heart of a good father. And that's not the heart of God. Children are incredibly gifted at observing. They're sponges. They see everything, whether you want to or not. Uh, they, they will observe things. I can remember being in the grocery store with, with one of my kids, 
and we were checking out, and he got so, Dad, 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 do you see? Do you see? I'm like, what, what do I see? We're in a grocery store. I see everything. He said, like, do you see that lady's purse? I'm like, yeah, I see this purse. He's like, it's the same colors as Auntie's purse. Like, why do you know that? Like, one, I didn't even notice the purse, and two, I never would have considered that it was the same color as my sister's, but he not only saw that and remembered it, but also like, was excited to have this connection. Like Kids are incredibly observant, however, sometimes lack in interpretation skills. They see everything, but don't always know how to put, piece it together. They don't always know how to put things together. And so they see adults doing things, and it's just normal for them because that's what adults do, but they don't really know how to, to communicate it. And sometimes we see God doing stuff, and we don't quite understand how it's all going to work out. And so in our lack of understanding, and the way that we're not perceiving things, we fill the gaps with suspicion. Can I, can I actually, like, you're doing a thing that I don't quite understand. I don't know how this relates with the things that you've told me before, and so I'm going to fill that gap with suspicion. Can I trust you? I don't, mm, I don't know that I can. And if we let our hearts wander that path, uh, some, sometimes it's bitterness, sometimes it's cynicism, of just being skeptical of what God's doing in the world, like, like we just end up at a point where we just, God is just out to get me. He just won't leave me alone. Like, I just want to live a quiet life. I just want to, to, to spend time with my family or do my work. And I just want to have enough money so that I can sit in front of the TV and be entertained and then do it. Like, I just want to live a quiet life. And he just keeps getting in my business. And he won't leave me alone. And God's just kind of out to get me. He's out to, to mess with me. I have a, a friend who says, I moved out to the forest so that everybody would leave me alone. And God didn't get the memo. Friends, God's not out to get you. If God wanted to get you, he would have got you. I have never once had the thought, heart, beat, 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 beat. Because if that is what I thought, I would never have another thought. If I was in control of making sure that my heart was on rhythm the whole time, like it would, I would not have lived very long at all because sometimes I have a little bit of ADD and I get distracted by something that's shiny going down the road, right? And yet God, by his grace, has my heart beating. And so far as I can tell, it's been on rhythm the, my whole life. And it's a gift. But if I didn't start it, and I'm not keeping it going, I actually have no control over when it stops. If God were out to get you, he would have got you. And if he's meddling with your life, it's because he cares for you. If you, who, who, are, who are, are wicked and narrow-minded, if you, who are, who are, who are, who are incomplete and who are, are not quite there yet, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give you good gifts? Like, how much more is he concerned that he provides for you the things that you need? And we fill those gaps of misunderstanding with suspicion and we, we draw our hearts away from him because we're afraid he's going to take what he's already given to us as a gift and he wants to give us more and he wants for us to grow. And that's the heart of God. We can trust God. I'm not sure if anybody else will tell you that this week. But we can trust God. And it's a process. You notice, ask, and it'll be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened. You're not there yet. None of us are there yet. I'm not there yet. The encouragement is, God's a good father, so seek, so ask, so knock on the door. Don't curl up in a ball and be mad at God because he's not giving you anything that you're not asking for. He says, get up and ask. Seek. You're not there yet. We've got more to grow together in. So are we moving towards trust in Jesus? We're not, I'm not saying we're there yet. I'm not saying we've got it perfect. I'm not saying we've got it all ironed out. But are we moving towards trust in Jesus? Is the trajectory of our habits, is the trajectory of our thoughts, is the trajectory of the way that we are choosing to live 
moving towards trust in Jesus. That's kind of a big, kind of a big idea. Like, okay, there's a relationship with God thing. But it's, it's fascinating to me. These, uh, the paragraph breaks are actually something that's added later. So like Matthew, as he was writing, did not give this next section a, a heading that says the golden rule. Like that's something that we've kind of added so that as we're looking at the page, we can find those verses real, real quick because those are likely the ones we're looking for. But notice Jesus never calls this next section the golden rule. Like that's a label that we have put on it. And I don't know that it's particularly helpful. But he says, um, in, in starting from this is the heart of God, to care for you, to answer your questions, to provide for you the things that you need, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Oftentimes this has a label of the golden rule. There are many different um, secular sources that will have a similar statement. Um, and I spent probably too much time doing research on the other things that people like to lump this saying with. Um, there are, are corollaries in ancient Egypt, in ancient India, in ancient Greece, in ancient Persia, and in ancient uh, Rome. Like there all different kinds of people have said something uh, similar. But as I have looked at them, all of their statements are negative, where Jesus is positive. Whatever you wish that others would do to you. All of them, all of the other ones say, if you don't want somebody to do that to you, then don't do it to them. But Jesus' Jesus's encouragement here is actually a little bit more proactive here. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. And this is a summary of the whole Old Testament, which, I, which is mind-boggling to me, because there's, that's, that's a lot. There's a lot there to say that what the, the, the summary of how you ought to behave is as you wish others would do to you, do also to them. That's a lot. There's a whole lot of story. There's a whole lot of God working and a whole lot of really messed up people. And Jesus just says, here's, here's the whole thing. You want to know how to live right? As you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. It's a deep well, uh, and I'm, I'm trying hard not to fall into it. Um, but I'm going to tell you something because if you haven't heard it yet, you will hear it. Um, there's there's a, a, a conversation in our culture today which says that the golden rule uh, is actually insufficient. That the golden rule uh, is, is not great and that the thing that we should live our lives by is called the platinum rule. Which says that as others wish for you to do to them, so you ought to do. So instead of thinking about what, what I would want for somebody to do to me, I'm going to do that to them. I'm going to think about, from the other person's perspective, what they want for me to do for them, and I'm going to do that. It's called the platinum rule. It sounds, on the surface, it sounds a little bit better, doesn't it? Like there's something about it that's a little bit, that I'm like, I, maybe, maybe they're on to something, because, because even in Philippians it says, we read it together this morning, consider, uh, look not only to your own interests, but consider also the interests of others. And I, uh, but as Philippians articulates that, he says, look also at Christ Jesus, who met the most incredible need, not by clinging on to his godness, but by laying it down and being a servant of other people. I think what the platinum rule does is actually, it actually negates love. There's, there's a, a, there are um, these verses that, if you've heard them, you've probably heard them at a wedding, although they were written in a context of church discipline, which is a whole different can of worms that I'm not going to do this morning, um, that says, love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, does not boast, it does not insist on its own way. And so I think what the platinum rule does is it, it, it forces us to be demanding. That you have to do to me the way that I want to be. And it also fails the test of universality. Uh, the test of universality would be like, does this apply in every situation forever? In which case I would say, can I, should I, ought I to do unto a dictator that which they would have me do unto them? In good conscience, I can't. Now, hypothetically, we have dictators, but... Uh, as Americans, we say, oh, no, 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 that's all, that's all somewhere else on the other side of the world. But, okay, so what about an abuser? Can I, should I do unto an abuser that which they would have me do unto them? Probably not. And so uh, 
the only alter, the alternative I have is, is to go back to Jesus, who said, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. It's a deep well. <laughs> but did you notice that without taking a breath, Jesus shifted from our relationship with the Father to a relationship with other people? Seek God. Knock on the door. God will open the door for you, and then you will do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Like, I, I thought I could be, I, I thought for a long time that I could, if I could get away from people, I'd have a whole lot easier time having a good relationship with God. Like, like doing the whole love one another thing would be a whole lot easier if the only person I had to love was me, right? Now, I have enough difficulty doing that, but like I'm just saying, like if I could just get rid of everybody else, then maybe me and God could get along okay. But Jesus takes the, this, this heart of seeking and, and loving and trusting God and immediately applies it to the way that we interact with our neighbor. We pray together weekly, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Which, in my estimation, is perhaps the most dangerous prayer that we pray. If we, as, as Christians, as believers, as those who have put our faith in Jesus to forgive our sins, can look at a brother and say, you have sinned against me and I will hold you to it. I will make you pay. You will suffer for the wrong that you did to me. We have completely misunderstood the grace that we've received. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. What do our human relationships say about our connection with God? It was a really, really bad week in my house. And it's my fault. Like, I don't know what the funk was. Like, I didn't have the crud. I had the funk where just, like, nothing in my head worked right. And everything was annoying. Every voice just got on my nerves. Do you know the funk? It was a bad week in my house. And what do our human relationships say about our connection with God? I, I hurt my family in the way that I spoke to them this week. And I don't know that I did a great job of fixing that. But I prayed with him. I said, God, like, you know where my heart's at, and I don't even really understand it. And I'm sorry that I've hurt them, but I don't even know how to make it right. So I, I present this to you not as somebody who's mastered it, but as somebody who comes to the deep well and asks Jesus, would you redeem me? Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. And this here, I think, is the picture for our whole series. There's a big gate, a big door, is wide and it's easy to walk on. And there's another little door off to the side that might be difficult to see and harder to get to. You have to make a choice to go that way. But the door is open. The door is open. And I, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church, so every time I heard these verses, I knew it was heaven and hell conversation. I knew this was about our eternal destiny. And, and by the end of our passage, we're definitely going to get there by the end of chapter 7. And I think there's an, a, a principle here that's applicable there. But the thing that is fascinating to me is he's talking about the way, the path. Go through the door and walk the path. That's before you die. This is a, a choice for how we live today. Enter by the narrow gate. Jesus' instruction to you, go through the narrow gate. I have opened the door. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. The one who knocks it will be opened. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard 
that leads to life. Jesus opens the door to life and invites us to truly live. I sometimes get in a, in a bad habit where my brain doesn't work the way, like I'm not quite all the way figured out how to make my brain do the things that I want it to do. And, and so here's, here's how I would sometimes interact with a message like this. Um, my brain would say, well, Mike, you failed. And if you failed, you're a failure. And if you're a failure, you're doomed to fail for forever. And so just make peace with that and uh, do your best. Well, the only alternative I have is to go back to Jesus who says, enter by the narrow gate. The way is, the door is open. I have made a way and I have walked the path. And life is either going to be hard because you're going to make choices that are consistent with God's character and the world is going to oppose you as you try to live lovingly and forgive those who you have to have every expectation that they ought to pay you back. And you're going to make choices that are going to occupy your time and your mind in a way that the world just will not understand. But the door is open and we can walk that way. And if we walk that way, we walk in life. <laughs> but Jesus is, Jesus is super binary here. He gives you only two options. If you're not on purpose walking on that way that's hard, the default then is the way that leads to destruction. There is no neutral path. There is no just like, yeah, I'm just going to be a little bit at peace with everybody and I'm not going to rock the boat and everything's going to be fine and then I'll just end up where the narrow path is going to. Is walk with me or walk away. Because Jesus opens the door to, true, to life and he invites us to truly live. How... Are we choosing to walk with Jesus this week? I'd say you're on, you're on a, a good foot here. Like if you're in the sound of my voice, then you already made the choice that I was, uh, was going to come and I was going to hear some psychopath talk too much about the, the Bible, right? Like he just had said too many words, like, okay, now I can, whatever. Like we're on the right path. We're choosing to, to be under the proclamation of the word. That's, that's a good place to start, but, but you can, like, what we can do in an hour here is not sufficient to make you a disciple of Jesus. Like, like This is a good place to start, but the only thing that I try to do here is to point you to Christ and to give you some kind of an encouragement that you should follow him. But you walk out the door, and I've got, I don't have any way to help you do that. I'm trying to figure out, like, should I do more social media? Should I send more text messages? Like, how do I do? Like, I, I don't know what my responsibility is, but what I want to do in this time here is encourage you, give you something that you say, yeah, I should follow Jesus this week. Inspire you to go and do that, to touch your heart, to be, to be motivated, to go and follow Christ. But, but that, in and of itself, that motivation is not enough to carry you all the way to next Sunday. My encouragement to you is to meet him yourself in his word. Like he, he, he resides in that in a very special way. And the voice of the Holy Spirit sounds like the Bible because he wrote it. How are we choosing to walk with Jesus this week? He, none of us came into the world by ourselves and, and, and none of us journeys through life by ourselves. Like maybe surround yourself with some other people who are trying to wrestle with these passages. Like what, is this, what does this mean? Whatever I would do to other, like how do I do that with my kids? Because what I wish that they would do to me is that they would be, like, attentive and listen. And I think they should do that to me, but then, but then I'm frustrated and I've got things to do and I've got to get them in the car and I've got to get them dressed and, like, I can't listen. I cannot take the time now to listen to what they're saying. Oh. We need other people to say our words back to us so that we can hear just how foolish we sound. Which requires that we trust other people. Say, hey, this is actually what I'm thinking. This is actually how I'm processing this. How are we choosing to walk with Jesus this week? Sometimes walking with Jesus is walking with those who are walking with him. 
I might not feel like I really need help, but maybe I'm there to help somebody else. And I might feel like I can't help somebody else, but maybe I'm there to be helped. Because none of us has arrived yet. So, ask, and it will be open. Seek, and you will find. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be open. Oh, Jesus, we need you. Oh, God, we need you. We need you for uh, matters of eternal destiny. To either live with you in glory for all eternity or to, or to live separated from you and to bear that burden alone. But Lord, even this day, even these hours, how to, how to interact with our family and our coworkers and the people in the grocery store, God, our neighbors, Lord, we need you here. You give us hope for the future, but you walk with us today, and God, we need you. I need you. And I can't go that way unless you pave it first. And I can't bear those difficulties unless you shoulder the burden with me. You tell me that your yoke is easy. So in days where I feel like it's heavy, would you help me to see what I've loaded up that's unnecessary? Would you move me towards trusting you? Lord Jesus, if there is somebody in the sound of my voice that has not started has not ever said to you, Jesus, I, I, I think I trust you. I want to trust you. Lord, I pray that you would give them the faith to say those words to you. That God, as those words come to your ears, that you would save them. That you would fill them with your spirit. That you'd give them that new life that you have opened the door to. Lord, would you open it as they knock? For those who are weary of the journey, who've seen these go wrong in a thousand different ways, who have filled our misunderstandings with suspicion, by your grace, would you beckon us back to the narrow gate? You are the way. You are life. Would you renew in us the joy of our salvation? It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.